Hello, everyone listening today. I am completely honored to be here with Kelly McDaniel, LPC, MCC. Kelly changed my life in one weekend with a book she wrote called Mother Hunger that we'll be talking a lot about. I want to tell you a little bit about her background before we dive in. Kelly is a licensed professional counselor, author, mother, and women's advocate. In her first book, Ready to Heal, she named an attachment injury as mother hunger and started a movement. Women resonated with the concept and wanted treatment. Since then, Kelly devotes herself to nurturing insecure attachment and maternal deprivation in adult women. In her second book, Mother Hunger, Kelly speaks to the millions of women who suffer with a lifelong emotional burden that adversely affects self-worth, eating patterns, and relational wellness. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you so much for having me here today, Shelby. You're welcome. Is there anything that you'd like to add to that and anything that comes to mind where you are, how you are today? <laughs> Well, as I listen to you read the bio and introduce me, I think, is that really, is that me? <laughs> and sometimes when I read the Mother Hunger book or I listen to my own audio periodically, um, it's really helpful. And I sometimes think, wow, I, I was, I was, I worked hard and it paid off. And today on in, or any given day, I'm like, I couldn't do that again. I just couldn't do it again. It took a lot. Um, I'm still recovering from writing that book. And so I, I feel the emotion kind of come up and like, I'm so glad I could do it when I did. Mm. Yeah. I can feel that emotion too in myself. I can't even imagine what it would take and how you've had to recover. And especially with the amount of people who've been drawn to the work on top of that, you must have... A, such an enormous capacity. <laughs> you know, I think like everyone else, um, the the capacity that I have was deeply impacted by a pandemic. And this book came out in the middle of COVID, um, kind of in the first year, when we're all a little more used to what's happening, but still uncomfortable, um, different levels of hiding and staying safe. And uh and there was a postpartum period for sure after the book was born. I went into my own quiet zone and I was helped by the pandemic. So coming out of that, we're all in different stages of even still re-entering the world and figuring out how to do that in how to titrate our own exposure. And I, I don't know that I have fully recovered from the book's publication, given what was what was going on and that our world still seems to be reeling. Absolutely. Well, that yeah. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. Well, for folks who don't know what mother hunger is, it might make more sense to them why it was so much to recover from. Would you share just a bit about what you mean by mother hunger and um, in, in a simple way, and then we'll break it down together over time? Sure. I would be happy to. When I first found this term mother hunger uh it was after my first book so it was somewhere like 2007 8 9 somewhere in there um and the term kind of found me because the women i was working with collectively had a yearning for a quality of love that they were looking for um and kept confusing it with romance so we're running into trouble and and when i would get to the core with each woman about what's hurting and pause and slow down over and over again in my office, I would hear, I want my mom. Mm. And then as we would unpack that a bit, I learned it wasn't actually the mother that this person has that she wanted. It was a mother. It was a quality of care that as primates, as mammals, we need from a mother. And so I, it, it, I think one of the hardest things about writing the book is really uh, deciding what is that care exactly? What is it that we actually are born needing? 
because we're mammals. And so what I came up with is what we need is nurturing. We need protection. And eventually we also need some guidance. So those first two needs, protection and nurturing are as primitive. They're both so basic, like nurturing means all the attunement, the feeding, the holding, the caring, the sounds, the smells, everything we need to have an imprinted sense of trust and love. And then protection kind of speaks for itself. We're so vulnerable as infants for so long that we do need uh, protection from all kinds of things. So without those two elements, we don't thrive. Sometimes we don't survive. If we do survive, eventually we're going to also turn to our mothers for guidance on what it is to be a woman. Mm -hmm. um, so these three elements seem to be what women were looking for without a word for it, without awareness. They were just searching for a quality of love, a certain kind of safety, and then some inspiration, like someone mm -hmm. to it. And so um, that creates all kinds of issues around relationships with best friends, relationships with employers, relationships with lovers, and Absolutely. ultimately sometimes with our own children. Yeah. Not to mention food and substances and how we well, do right. one thing is kind of how we do everything, right? Well, what I've learned is the food and the substances, primarily the food, because it's the most primitive thing we can use as a surrogate mother, is it falls under the nurturing category. That's how we learn to nurture ourselves when we're not getting it from a person. First thing we have access to, other than sucking our thumb, is food, generally. That's where we first learn maybe what love feels like because it calms us down when we have a full belly. Later, when we have access to substances, it's related to both nurturing and protection because really I think addiction is a search for safety. Absolutely. It's a way to regulate ourselves. It's a, it's a way to come home to our body, feel okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I just want to thank you for a couple of things. As I was reading your book the first time about a year and a half ago, I think I had never heard anyone describe what happens to someone when they were under nurtured and under cared for emotionally or physically by a mother in a non pathologizing way. There were no uh, diagnoses, no, you're bad, you're wrong, no shaming, no adding to the stress and load that folks already experience when they're suffering with this kind of injury. And I just love that you called it an injury instead of a wound because that's what it feels like. It's such a deep heartache and heartbreak and the aftermath of that, it can be life altering, life ending, life changing, you know, depending on the outcomes. And so I just want to say thank you for being a voice in the field that helps us look at what's happening in a kind and compassionate way instead of shaming and blaming. Thank you for recognizing that. Um, and I love the words you use, life altering, sometimes life ending, but definitely lifelong. And I appreciate that you can recognize it took some effort to find language that was non-pathologizing and non-shaming because everything about our career is based on shaming diagnoses um, and our culture puts so much shame on us when we aren't functioning in a way that whatever a woman is supposed to be doing. Um, so it, it, I almost didn't write the book for fear of contributing to a culture that already makes mothering difficult makes being a woman difficult. I did not want to add to that. I was trying to soothe it. So I appreciate the way it landed for you. Mm, every word. I yeah. felt myself as somebody who I believe fits in the category of third degree mother hunger. I felt myself less alone. I felt myself affirmed in the decisions I made to divorce my mother. <laughs> I felt that the heartache and grief and the everything you talk about around waiting for the apology and the repair, that I what there was nothing wrong with me <laughs> for the first time, maybe ever, that, oh my goodness, there's words for this. There's 
an experience that is not just mine, that is so much more universal than I had ever known or imagined. That's why I wrote the book, because the women coming to see me, I, I was blown away. This is epidemic. Like it wasn't just something I made up one day for my first book. This is a thing. And so started mm -hmm. naming what I was seeing over and over again, the apology ache, yeah. that yearning for a mother to recognize the harm that she caused, even if it was, you know, outside her control and accidental, still to have her say, this did happen. I wish it hadn't. And how can I make it better now? You know, that that that's a real need. And when it's not going to get met, recognizing that is a very adult thing to do that there's very little cultural support for. Yeah. And even clinical support. You know, this isn't something that's taught in our training. No. But now it's a part of our world, which is so wonderful. <laughs> I have so many questions. I would love to talk a little bit about the nurturance, the protection and the guidance and how, if somebody's recognizing this in themselves, that they're maybe yearning for it or longing for it, how they might start healing if they don't have access to that in their mother. Oh, right. Well, uh, most of us have to heal this without our mothers, regardless of the degree of mother hunger. And mother hunger does exist on a spectrum because it's an attachment injury and we're all injured in such unique ways, just as every mother-daughter relationship is unique. So in that way, I do talk a lot about healing in the book in general ways, but women have to find their own recipe for, for what's going to work. And so identifying what were you most missing is usually the first step. Were you missing nurturing or did you have a nurturing mother, but she wasn't quite adult enough to protect you and guide you? Or perhaps you had a nurturing mother in a relatively safe childhood, but by the time, let's say middle school or high school came along and you really wanted some guidance, you realized your mother was limited and not going to be able to provide that. Um, those are all different degrees and different formulas. And then you mentioned third degree mother hunger, which is when all three of those areas were compromised severely and a mother was a frightening figure. Mm -hmm. When the first attachment object that we have is scary, it really, really messes with our attachment system where we learn to bond with somebody who's inherently untrustworthy and that gets played out all through the lifespan. So healing third degree mother hunger really is a separate form of healing than some of the other forms, but all require identifying first what was lost and then finding ways to replace it. So if nurturing was lost, chances are eating is going to need some focused attention. How you eat, do you overeat, do you undereat, are you somewhere in between and um, finding out how to really fuel the body with loving, nutritious food and rhythm. Um, I like to listen to women talk about food because each story about how how we eat tells a story about how we learned what love felt like. Mm -hmm. So if it was invasive or frightening, there, there may be a tendency to go toward anorexia and rejecting anything that might feel like a mother's an early love before we had language. Um, if there wasn't enough of her, then there may be a desire for lots of ice cream and sweet things. Um, those things really represent love in the body. Mm. Um, and again, these are not things we're doing wrong. These are not disorders. These are what we do to replace what was lost. Um, other ways we can replace nurturing, because it's usually a lack of touch as well, or touch that felt good, is to find ways to heal with um, non-erotic body work, um, gravity blankets, mm -hmm. self-touch and nurturing. Um, protection, moving on to, to protection, again, how we feel safe in the world is different for all of us. Um, and, and to one extreme, it can mean we, we do isolate perhaps and stay home and kind of avoid 
And that's a necessary transition point sometimes when realizing there was a lack of protection. I encourage women to titrate news exposure. There's only so much crisis and disaster we can hear when we're healing from our own crisis and disaster. Um, and then for guidance, you know, I, I tend to think sometimes guidance is one of the easier things to replace because we can find inspiring women around us or men to turn to for coaching or um, wisdom. But in saying that, I don't want to diminish how how difficult it is for daughters that didn't have guidance from their mothers to tease that out without feeling like, was I embarrassed by her or was I afraid of her? And that's a complicated process because there's a lot more brain activity going on. Mm -hmm. The earlier form of nurturing and protection, a lot of that happened before we had prefrontal cortex online. We don't remember it. We know when we couldn't look to her for guidance and it's it's it can be very difficult to, to look at that and identify that so that we can go get that need met. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I took a lot of deep breaths as you were sharing, just aware of my own nervous system and the nervous systems of folks who are listening, possibly for the first time in their lives, making some sense of some things that they're experiencing. And that word titration really stood out, you know, just little by little by little, slowly, slowly gathering all of these things back in. Yeah. Yeah. And that can be, listening to this can be a lot. I mean, talking about it even is a lot. Both of our hearts are right here. Um, and when people talk to me about reading the Mother Hunger book, I love it when I hear women say, I have to read it in small bits. I read a little bit and I put it down. Or I'm hearing, especially women with third degree Mother Hunger, do better listening to the book, the audio, rather than reading it. And I'm learning from feedback that that's because when they read it, they hear their own voice or their mother's voice and they can't move yeah. through the chapters. But if they can listen to my voice, somehow they can digest it a little bit more, but it's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. I really want to underline too, for the folks out there in the world who tend to think everyone else's stress and suffering is so much greater than theirs or Mo other people have experienced trauma or traumatic stress and I haven't that that early childhood development the prenatal experience of even having a mother that was preoccupied with what was going on in pregnancy or anxious about money or things that seem fairly basic those things actually can impact our experience of ourselves and that experience of nurturing and protection in the ways that each of our own unique nervous systems, hearts, minds, and bodies need it. If that attunement isn't there, if the empathy isn't there, because the mom is just simply surviving, trying to tend to her own emotions and experience. It's not like it was intentional or um, that it was malicious. It's like, yeah. this can happen in some of the circumstances that seemed really benign. Would you say that's true? Completely true. I talk about in the book that this is not about love or lack of love. It can be in the third degree scenario, but in general, this is an epigenetic, epigenetic inheritance that we get from our mothers and our grandmothers and our great grandmothers, all doing the best they can within structures that don't support women, that don't support the necessary human connection between mothers and children, advocate things that are really, really harmful about teaching independence. And these things really damage the mother-child bond. And it's not about love. Mother, many well-meaning mothers follow guidance that is just misinformed. And mothers need guidance so much. Um, during pregnancy and during the formative time, um, just as much as their infants are gonna need guidance one day as they grow up. So we're not guiding correctly the women that are that are becoming mothers. It's part of the work I love doing is working with women who are thinking about becoming pregnant, already are pregnant, 
already have children on the ground and <laughs> realize, oh my. So it's, I, yeah, I like doing that work. Yeah, it's so important. I want to talk a little bit about what came to my mind as you were saying, you know, what it took to put this book out in the world and the recovery. As I was looking back at your book, you mentioned implicit memory and how our bodies carry these memories that are often pre-verbal. And, and we go through life trying to put words to something that is a feeling that is so deep and core and it feels like it's been around forever and will be around forever. Can you talk a little bit more about these body memories, these implicit memories and how that happens, how we don't have words for things sometimes? Right, right. Because our body holds a memory before language came online and before our thinking brain came online. So explicit memory is the kind of memory we all can relate to. Explicit memory is something we can recall. We can tell the story that goes with it. We have sometimes dates and times. We know pieces of our story. We remember our first day of camp or our first day of third grade, or maybe we remember um, a certain holiday. That's explicit memory, something we can recall and talk about. Implicit memory are the experiences that happened to us before we had language, uh, full cognition, which doesn't come on till about uh, age five or six, sometimes four. There can be glimpses around three, I found. Um, but implicit memory is in the body and can happen as soon as about six weeks uh, in utero. We start to digest our environment and make sense of our body based on our first environment, which is our mother's body. Um, so if she is stressed, if she is anxious, if she is excited, um, her emotions are flowing through her body and reaching ours. And we're swallowing them, making sense of who we are before we're even born. Um, and then in the first three years, we are learning what love feels like through touch, how we're held, how we're fed, the sounds around us. Um, all that is creating a body memory of what love feels like, of what loneliness feels like. So if you think about it for just a minute, many of us were raised and more are still being raised with sleep training, with really poor advice to let a baby cry it out in the crib. And the advice comes along with saying, well, eventually the baby will stop crying and see you succeeded, which that is, I guess, if that's what you're going for, a success. But if what you're really going for is a way to attach to your infant, it does just the contrary, because what the infant's actually learning in the crib while crying out for care is that no one's there. And the infant brain can't make sense of that, so the body prepares the infant for death. Because if nobody's coming, our primitive bodies, if we were left out in the wilderness without someone to come, we would be eaten. We wouldn't survive that or we would freeze, or we would bake, whatever. It's not something we would survive. So, and many babies in orphanages didn't survive when they weren't responded to. So this is hard to hear, but sleep training leaves in our body a desperate sensation of loneliness that could lead to annihilation. And what I find is that when adults have an experience like primal panic, that comes up and grabs them out of nowhere in the middle of the night, upon waking, upon trying to sleep while driving, sometimes it's the body having a memory of what it was like to be utterly, desperately alone. Hmm. We're not designed to be. And it's really sad that we expect our infants to endure this. Hmm. And I think that's the seed of mother hunger right there. Yeah. Right now it feels like grief in my own body. And I think that you said it's heartbreak it's the first thing. in the body. Yeah. And, and when we think about grief and how to heal grief, when there's an injury we can see because maybe it's a cancer diagnosis, maybe it's a funeral, 
We know there's heartbreak. We can tend to it. But with mother hunger, we can't see this heartbreak. We haven't known it's there. We haven't been able to talk about it. So that heart, that grief freezes in the body because it doesn't have a place to go. There's not enough support for it. And it makes us sick. And it's why I talk about the two core elements of mother hunger are frozen grief, grief that's had no place to go. So it waits. A heartbreak just grows. We look for all kinds of ways to soothe it. Nothing quite does. And shame, because deep in our belief system, we think it's because something's wrong with us. Mm -hmm. We, as little ones, we can't know that maybe something was wrong with our caregiving environment. It'd be way too hard to know. The belief system gets set pretty young that something's wrong with me, that I'm not being cared for. That's not cognitive. That's embodied, an embodied sense of shame that says I am inherently unworthy of love and belonging. Yeah. And it might actually be dangerous to ourselves to if we did know that it was our environment and not us. It's easier to go, oh, I'm bad. I'm unworthy. I'm undeserving. Once we can make sense of it, yes. But even before we can, it's not like we can, if we're afraid, it's not like we can flee or fight. Yeah. You know, the, the fighting instinct is crying. Yeah. Crying is a baby moving. Mm -hmm. um, there's nowhere to go. And so the body will do the next thing, which is freeze. Mm -hmm. And we learn to appease our caregivers and we, we freeze our grief. Mm. Yeah. And when it gets to third degree mother hunger, though that is when you talked about, you know, the body's preparing for death. The gut shuts down when we're experiencing that level of fright or threat. All sorts of immune functions are compromised. We end up possibly with chronic illness, chronic fatigue, because we're carrying such a heavy load from enduring that threat in a constant way the body doesn't know what else to do besides just work extra hard trying to survive so well said so well said which is why it's no big surprise right that we end up in midlife with autoimmune struggles and um, compromised immune systems digestive problems headaches stomach aches mm -hmm. back aches our body's been working hard Mm hmm. Yeah, we call that an allostatic load in the developmental trauma world. It's a lot to carry. Yeah. Yeah. Those terms are so um, helpful in the clinical community, and I didn't find them real helpful in writing the book. So I tried to find other ways of explaining it to yeah. folks that aren't clinically trained to try to help them make sense of what 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 that is the allostatic load right mm -hmm. yeah it's the body befriending us and keeping us alive it sure is and that was what i wanted to point to as kind of one of our last things again thanking you for writing this in such a non-pathologizing way this is one of the only books that talks about attachment that i have ever read that includes the experience of disorganized attachment in a more thorough way. I felt left out <laughs> of all the other attachment books. It's not only thorough, but it's affirming. It's helpful. It's supportive. It's illuminating. And, and if we weren't aware, we might call the symptoms borderline personality disorder, as you say, bipolar disorder. Do you want to share more about that? That's what we have called it. Yeah. I just, in my practice, I never could, I couldn't settle with it. I couldn't use the terms. I didn't like the terms. Um, and early on, I didn't have the awareness of complex PTSD yet. So I think Christine Courtois was writing about it as I was also writing about it. But, I, you know, I just didn't didn't find words as elegant as Christine's when I needed them. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think you're right. The disorganized attachment category 
is, is largely left out of attachment theory language and dialogue, um, which is all still pretty fresh anyway. Um, and it's just now kind of moving into the mainstream where people kind of can joke about their uh, anxious attachment or avoidant attachment, but you don't hear anybody joking about their disorganized attachment. It's not funny. And I think there's a lot of uh, still a lack of awareness. Yeah. And stigma. Well, stigma, because I think it gets thrown into these terrible diagnoses. Yeah. Other than let's call this what it is. This is when your attachment system formed in a soup of fear. Yeah. You're going to look like somebody who on any given day is up here, down here, losing their mind. That's normal. That's not a pathology. That's because you're trying to make sense of how to attach when it's inherently not a good idea. Our attachment system will trump any other system. So it's going to trump even if somebody is dangerous, we're going to still attach. And that's going to create some personality problems. Yeah. But no one suffers more than the person with the personality issue. Yeah, the other people around it. That's what I don't like about these diagnoses. It's all focused on how hard it is on everyone else. Well, that's not talking about on what it's like for the person living this way. Yeah. Oh, which is what I wanted the third degree chapter to help explain. Like this hurts to live this way. Mm. I love this soapbox. I got full body goosebumps. Okay. And it is, it is um, so important, it is deeply important. And I so appreciate your willingness to go against the stream and speak towards these things in such a compassionate way. Thank you. Thank you for having the clinical expertise and the heart to hold the complexity yeah uh, this book but also specifically third degree mother hugger mm. once we can sit in this place it's easy it's easy to open my door when my clients come in with it it's i cry with them all the time <laughs> about it because folks have been spending decades trying to be seen understood empathized with work through repairs with it's actually easy and it's such a deep honor. And I imagine you feel similarly. I do, I do. I think um, it's an honor to do this work. And the relief that women feel when they have some other name for this that doesn't add more insult to injury is a joy. Yeah. Oh, well, I wish we could talk for hours. <laughs> but we will bring this to a close. Is there anything at all that you'd like to share or express uh, to end this today? My gratitude for you, Shelby, because I think um, it's a podcast like this with a heart like yours that helps me get this book into the hands of the women that need it. Mm -hmm. I'm not really a promoter. I'm not a marketer. So I don't have an agent. I don't have a publicist. People that find this book and willingly help educate, it's such a gift. So thank you. Hmm. You are so welcome. Thank you for trusting me with all of this and with your time. I will share in the show notes all of the ways that folks can find you and come see you. Is there anything off the top of your head that you'd like to encourage them to look for? Well, there is a thing coming up in March. It'll be the first kind of public appearance I've had um, in a while that my publisher, Hay House, is putting on in Phoenix, Arizona. And I think that's the fourth weekend in March. Um, and so maybe we'll get some details for your show notes about what that's called and um, who all is going to be there. I know Gabby Bernstein's a big speaker. She's going to be there. I'll be speaking on Sunday that weekend about Mother Hunger. Oh. So could be an opportunity to meet other women who are reading the book, um, looking for community. Um, I'm hoping for a soulful 90 minutes with, mm. with women and well, oh. any adults that are resonating with the book. Yeah. So cool. Wow. Well, thank you so much. And I look forward to the next time we get to connect. <laughs>